Let's open uh, and begin worship with prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and wonderful God, we thank you for a new day. We thank you for sunshine. We thank you for the breezes. We thank you for your love that calls us to yourself this day, that we might come, sing, pray, laugh, listen, hear you, and know you more, love you more, serve you more, adore you more. Would you help us through the power of your Holy Spirit? We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the land. From the east, west, north, and south, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our first hymn is number 643, Now We Thank, or Now Thank We All Our God. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Holy God, some of us have wandered about in what seemed like the desert waste of life. We have become hungry and thirsty. Our soul fainted within us. Others of us sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners of our own misery, rebelling against your words. We cry out to you, O Lord. The Lord delivers us from our distress when we cry out to him. God brings us out of darkness and gloom and breaks our bonds. Let us thank the Lord for his steadfast love and his wonderful works for humankind. In our Lord Jesus Christ, we are freed and forgiven. We give him thanks and praise. Thank 
steadfast love and amazing grace are we invited to come to you and hear you speak to us we give thanks to you for your word to us this day in jesus our first scripture is from numbers 21 verses 4 through 9 um, from the revised standard version from mount hor they set out by the way to the red sea to go around the land of edom but the people became impatient on the way the people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson this morning is from John 3, 14 through 21. Hear God's word. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may, be not, may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, 
so that may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Amen. May God have his blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. All right, if I'm not loud enough, just put your thumb and tell me it needs to go up, up. <laughs> I'll try and get closer. <laughs> Our story today in the book of Numbers is not a new story. This particular part of the story about the Israelites. If you look back through the whole of Numbers, we find that it's rebellion, correction, rebellion, repentance, correction. Rebellion, repentance, correction. Basically over and over through this part of the through the wilderness. Various tribes try to assert their own authority over Moses, Aaron, and even God. Just prior to this particular story, the Israelites have just had a, a triumph. They defeated the king of Arad, who had attacked them. With God's help, of course, they, they defeated him. And this was their first military victory. And, and they haven't quite gotten into Canaan yet, so they're, they're still in the wilderness, but they're getting closer to the promised land. And now they've had this military victory. And yet, after this victory, the wilderness, they are still unhappy. They are not just murmuring now, which is what scripture said they were doing before. Now they are speaking against God and against Moses. They complain that they have no water and no food. But that's not the truth, is it? Because they go on to say that they don't really like the food. They detest the food that they have, that God-given manna. And surely God and Moses are just trying to kill them. Complaints in scripture are nothing new. The Psalms are full of laments, if you go and take a look through the Psalms. But this seems to be a... The complaint it has a different aspect to it, a darkness to it. The people are basically turning against God and Moses. The word used here, speak, is debar. With, has, but this debar, this, this, this version of it, this, this um, is, is one that is saying it's an against. It's a, it's a speaking against in such a way as to expose someone or blame them, expose them to shame or blame them by the means of falsehood or presentation. They're essentially making things up and blaming God for them. It seems the Israelites' rebellious mistrust just continues to get worse instead of better. Instead of being a, having a more healthy fear of God or a healthy gratitude towards God. The snakes that are sent to the Israelites were poisonous, and those that were bitten, they died. Now, this must might make us wonder, well, is that a good that would send poisonous snakes as a punishment? But scripture doesn't say it's a punishment. We make that jump. Scripture just says God sent them poisonous snakes. But I think um, that conclusion may be accurate. One commentary writer reminds us that God has not exactly been warm and fuzzy throughout the whole Exodus ordeal. Beginning with the 10 plagues in Egypt, the Passover, that was where the angel of death came over and they had the, the blood on their houses to protect them. The smoke, fire, and the violence, you know, the violent shaking on the mountain. And then not too far back in this book of Numbers, we hear about the swallowing up of part of the Korahite tribe uh, in the earth that just opened and swallowed them, a plague that began to go out throughout the Israelites, and now snakes. You know, but the more I thought about this picture of snakes, the image that came to my mind may make you laugh. It did me. The picture I have is a parent on a long car ride with children in the back seat. How many of you have been on those long car rides with children in the back seat? I mean, long car ride, you know, all day long, and, and you keep going. And the children begin to kind of fuss and complain in the back seat. I don't know, your children probably didn't do that, but my children, our children did. 
And, you, and then the fussing kind of takes a turn and it begins to be that arguing and there's a fighting that going on in the back seat. And then they begin to argue with everything the parent says and does. And it isn't long before the parent turns around and says, and I'm sure you know what I'm going to say, do you want me to stop this car right here and I'll give you something to complain about? Anybody ever said those words or heard those words? <laughs> which usually meant some kind of physical sting that was like a punishment, I would think, you know, or consequence to this behavior that you'd ask to have stop in the back seat. This is what came to my mind as I contemplated the snakes and the people and God. Because all of a sudden, after the snakes come, the people realized they needed to have a different attitude where God was concerned. And so they repented and they confessed, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you, Moses. Indeed, they had. Now, snakes, I'm not fond of, but they have an interesting history in the Bible. I did a little snake research, and I found out that the word snake in Hebrew is nachash, and it's very close in meaning, near anonymous with the word for divination, that enchantments or or a sorcery kind of stuff, wisdom. And that's either nachash or nukush. Very close. They come from the same root word. What do these two have in common? I got curious, so I kept, I, I kept looking. I found some interesting ideas of why these two are related. It seems that snakes were used by sorcerers, people who did divination and magic. The first appearance of a serpent in scripture is most of you, it's in Genesis. And remember how the serpent appears and begins to tempt Adam and Eve to believe they can be divine, that, that they uh, can be wise, be just like God, but not in a good way. There's some thinking that the sound of the word nachash maybe comes from the sound of the snake. And I don't know if they mean the rattle of the snake or the hissing of the snake. I don't really want to get close enough to find out. But there is some thought that that, that might this comes this word comes from. It is very interesting. Well, what does it mean? Well, I wonder. Now, this is just me wondering. This is not any, um, I haven't read this by any other theologian. This is me wondering. Could God have looked at this rebellious, hissing group of people and their biting words and thought, they remind me of a bunch of snakes? I mean... They were kind of, you know, having a bad attitude. But that's just me thinking out loud. Don't take that as gospel. <laughs> the people in their confession of sin asked Moses asked and to pray for them to take, take away the snakes. But did you notice? God didn't take away the snakes. Instead, God had Moses do a very strange thing. He told them to craft a fiery seraphim um, serpent. The literal translation of the word that, that um, the adjective for serpent is can mean fiery or seraphim. I found that to be interesting too. That's probably another sermon day. And to set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made the serpent out of bronze, put it on a pole, and if they looked towards it, the people lived. This story sounds even more strange if we think about what we learned last week when we've got the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. Because because God gave strict instructions about having no graven images. What is God up to? Did Moses misunderstand? Why did God leave snakes and then give them a physical reminder in the form of a snake that, that gave them the reminder of God's promise? I wonder if the people looked at that snake, if they remembered that it wasn't this bronze thing that was healing them, it was God who said if they looked at it, they would be healed. If you look later in scripture, and I think it's in Kings, it turns out they began to take that bronze sculpture later and they began worshiping it and giving it gifts. So it tells me that later, this didn't, it became a snare instead of a help. I, I feel sometimes when we read scripture, if for, at least for me, sometimes I have more questions then I can find answers. But here's the question we can all answer this morning. Are we ever like the Israelites? 
what are we to do when our trials or challenges feel so overwhelming and we can't abide one more day of manna or whatever it is that's making us feel that we're sick and tired of it? What has been our response to God regarding these troubles? Have you felt any snakes biting you this week? It seems to me that the Israelites got lost. They were lost in the wilderness, but they were even more lost in their grumbling and their murmuring. And they couldn't see anything that was good. Not the triumph they just accomplished. Not even the manna so faithfully provided by God. And instead of taking their concerns and their, and their tiredness and their impatience directly to Moses and God, they begin against them instead. These kinds of moments should have caused the Israelites and should cause us to realize that we have a bigger problem than whatever it is we're dealing with. The problem is with our hearts because we are lacking in gratitude. We're lacking in thanksgiving. Our Psalm reminded us this morning, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. But how do we give thanks in the midst of troubles? We're in a COVID pandemic. We still have to wear masks. Not everybody has the vaccine. Well, maybe what Jesus said in, the, in our passage from John will help. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Most likely this is not our favorite scripture out of this passage. We much prefer the next one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who should ever believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, but first we must deal with Jesus being a snake on a pole. Why on earth would you compare himself to an image of a poisonous snake on a pole? I, it, it's curious. And I found one commentary writer's suggestion very interesting. He suggests that Jesus was like the staffs of Moses and Aaron. Remember in the beginning when they first met the Pharaoh, Moses carried his staff and God told him to throw it down and it became a snake. And they told him to pick up the snake and it became a staff again. Well, Mo Aaron was able to do the same thing and they were in front of Pharaoh that day and Moses told Aaron to throw his snake down or his staff down and it became a snake. And that, you know, they were, they, they, this was a wonderful, amazing act. But then the sorcerers, the wise men, the magicians of Pharaoh, they did the same thing. They threw their staffs down and they became snakes. It wasn't so amazing all of a sudden. But then Aaron's staff, which was still a snake, gobbled up, swallowed up all the other snakes. You see, it took a snake to beat that bunch of snakes. And even today, a person that's bitten by a poisonous snake is saved by the antivenom, taken from, yes, the same kind of snake. But this time, the snake's bite or venom is made to a cure rather than to inflict harm. It seems to me that Jesus implies here that he holds the antivenom for the results of our sinfulness that linger in this world. He is the one who swallows up the snakes of sinfulness, rebellion, disease, infirmities, illness, pain, taking the death they inflict as he is raised up on the cross. These things, many of them, I didn't name all of them, are still in this world today, much like the snakes in the wilderness. So like the snake that Moses put on, on the pole, this cross is where we can look for relief and find eternal life with God now. Jesus isn't just offering us a someday remedy. Like Moses' snake on the pole, the cross is effective for bites and the fiery fury of this world today. But relief won't come if all we do is murmur and speak against God and others. That will increase the result of our sinfulness. It will not help decrease it. It won't take it away. 
But when we gaze up at Jesus, telling him what's wrong, remembering that he is already endured everything on the cross, we can learn to trust and believe that he is the antidote to what we are going through as well. Why did God allow the snakes to continue? And why doesn't God fix all the snakes, a.k.a. the things that bite us today? You know, Jesus gave an explanation about this to his disciples one day. They encountered a man. This is in John chapter three, uh, 9. They encountered a man born blind. And the, and the disciples asked him, who sinned? Was it him or parents that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said it was his blindness was not, was not due to his or his parents' sin. It happened so that God's power might be seen at work in him. And then Jesus made some mud, put it on his eyes, and told him to go wash. And he was healed. The deception is still being practiced by the snake slash serpent. And it's real and it's always waiting to bite us and cause us problems. Well, how then do snakes lead to prayers of thanksgiving? Good question. Because God so loved the world. God has plenty of goodness and mercy, has not run out. Even for us who are in the midst of our grumbling or speaking against or have forgotten how to say thanks again. Thankfully. We can look to Jesus for our cure. Jesus is so much better than the bride. Jesus rose from the grave. He sits at God's right hand and has all authority in heaven and earth. And as the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 118, 15, that God's right hand does valiantly. And I read that this week. I said, oh, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is mighty and invites us to pray to him and with him and sends his Holy Spirit to help us. Well, I pray this week, amid the troubles that are going to creep in and the grumbles that may so easily roll off tongues, that we will remember to gaze upon Jesus and give thanks, which is the antidote for our grumbling. Rejoicing in God's love that is there to calm our anxiety, increase our energy. Thanksgiving will let us see all the blessings we've been missing. Looking to Jesus with prayers of thanksgiving often opens the way of God's healing and wholeness to reach the broken places in our mind, in our body, in our spirit. Maybe this can be our prayer this week. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. Let us pray. Lord God, you are mighty indeed. And oftentimes, we can lose our focus. We can become like grumbly children in the backseat of the car. We can be like the Israelites on a long road that doesn't seem to end and goes round and round to Canaan. we find ourselves concentrating on what the problem is instead of the one who has the answers. Who is the answer? Your son, Jesus. Lord, we are human beings, and you know that so well. Thank you for sending Jesus to us. Thank you that in the midst of the challenges of our our world, <clears throat> you don't leave us alone. Oh, we may, may choose to turn away from you, but you don't leave us alone. We may choose 
the darkness that calls to us, as John talked about, and Jesus, what Jesus talked about in John, we choose, may choose that darkness sometimes. Sometimes the darkness chooses us. We find ourselves immersed in a depression that's hard to get out of. Oh God, we need the light that your son offers. We need the light of someone to help us see light. Because someday the darkness is darker than we can manage to get out of. Lord God, I thank you that you always, always walk with us in the darkness. That in Christ you offer us the best remedy to snakes and everything else. For Jesus took every hurt we can imagine. That he could understand and help us bear whatever that pain is. Lord, this day we are grateful for springtime. It comes and it's cold and it's warm and it's cold and it's warm and we're thankful because we know it's getting a little warmer every day, even if snow is predicted this week. We're thankful that as we look towards these next days that we we pray for more people to find the vaccine and get enough for everyone to be vaccinated. Lord, we pray that, that the hurts of our world <clears throat> and the people that experience them will know, will know Jesus and that you will help us have words when it's appropriate to invite people to know the comfort and the care of your Son, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. For Lord, this day, there are many who are in need. Many we are adding to our prayer list today, or at least a few. <clears throat> Lord, we add Ray Bishop to our prayer list today. Um, he and Tracy and Patty's brother. Um, and many of their sister's brother as well, who found out this week that he has stomach cancer. So Lord, we lift up Ray as he goes this Tuesday to find out what the course of action, what the best course of treatment will be. And Lord, we know that is, that is really a, a terrible, um, stinging and awful diagnosis. But God, we believe you for more. We believe you for a way forward. And we believe you, Jesus, that the cross is effective for Ray. And that he will gaze up at you, even as we do this day, for your healing grace on Ray. Lord, we lift up Irene Gladden and, and, and Dorothy and her family over the death of Mark, um, Irene's son. They're still figuring out how he died. But God, we ask that you would comfort. We ask for your amazing grace that we sang about for this family. For no one expects their 21-year-old to, to just die when he goes out for a run. We thank you, Lord, for your wondrous grace that goes with us even into these dark times. We don't have answers, but we and they have you. Lord, I pray that they would lean on you. They would come to know you better and know that you have not left them alone. Lord, I lift up, we lift up today Catherine Cates, who had broke her wrist, and when she went back to get the cast off, they found out it wasn't healed. So, Lord, she's now in a brace, and she's getting some shots to help her heal. Lord, Lord God, we pray for your greater grace for, for Catherine, that these shots that her caring for her arm, Lord, you would take away the arthritis in that arm. We just ask you, by your wondrous grace, and help her arm to heal. We bless you, Lord, for your mercy over Catherine this day and for her, her trusting faith in you, Jesus. Lord, today again, we are lift up Gretchen, who is uh, experiencing breast cancer and will be having chemo and radiation and, and possibly more surgery. So, Lord, we continue to lift Gretchen to you and believe you for, for more of your grace, for, for taking away they also that's in her just completely gone that she might have the peace and shalom of wholeness we uh, lift up bill who continues to 
uh, recover. We lift up his brother-in-law who has kidney stones. We lift up Denise Chapman who continues to um, get help for the pancreatic cancer. We lift up Dorothy Teeter who continues to recover at home and is with us today on phone. We're so glad she's here. We lift up, um, we lift up Bill Carper and we praise you, Lord. He is doing, um, we thank you for that. Lita, who um, had a heart attack, she is getting better. We thank you for that. We lift up Cindy Butts, Lord, who is having trouble with her back. Judy Chalice, who is now having reconstructive surgery, who's on our prayer list. And Shirley Elliott, who's retaining fluid. She's on hospice, Lord. And we lift up Linda Hedges this morning. We think of these folks that are in the midst of the challenges of these many situations. And we thank you for those that are, are feeling better, Lord. Bless you and thank you. And we continue to believe for better for those others, Lord, for more grace in their situation. And that they would know as they look at Jesus that he is with them. And Lord, we especially lift up Mike Jessup who goes tomorrow for um, a scan of his brain. Lord, we believe you for no more tumors, no tumors at all. Lord, that he would be free of those tumors in his brain. Oh God, we lift up all who are mourning more than just the Gladden family, Lord. There are many. And we lift them to you this day for your greatest comfort in and through Jesus, in whose name we pray praying together the prayer that he taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We bless the Lord this day for the gifts, the gift of this day. We're thankful for the gifts and blessings that we are able to bless others with. And especially this day, we're thankful for all those who bless Jared's town with gifts. And, and offerings. So let us sing to God our blessing this day for the life that you have given. join together and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is Why Should I Feel Discouraged, number 661. <laughs>
I invite you this week, when the clouds come, when the grumbles arise, I invite you to sing. I know that sounds crazy, but I can just hear this echoing in my mind all week. I hope you will sing because God's eye is on you and me, his sparrows, and we can sing and give thanks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 